very quickly, um, uh, maybe uh, to, to add a little perspective to the, you know, the, the whole un the un unfairness of that, that 30 percent that we were giving away or as a tax. Um, you know, back in the day, when we talk about retail, I mean, you know, we were as developers, we were lucky to get three percent gross, and and then you know, factor in the marketing costs. I mean, you're barely making that much money at all, and so you know. Part of me is saying, well, what are you complaining about? You're getting 70% now, right? Um, but again, the other part of me is saying, well, that's, I mean, for an, as a developer, I mean, that, that does seem kind of unfair because you're, you're, you're putting, pouring your sweat, blood, and tears into your product, and now just somebody just you know, swoops in and just you know, takes a cut right from the top. So, you know, that, that's, that's definitely something to, to, to think about. Um, uh, I definitely agree in terms of the, uh, you know, games being global, but be very careful about China. Um, they don't necessarily respect, you know, copyright and trademarks and things like that. And um, yeah, they're, they're, they'll swoop right in if, if they see something that's successful and they'll replicate it, you know, make some money, get, get out, move on to the next thing. So be, tread carefully in China. Cool. So, um, as we start to kind of wrap up, uh, one of the things is, you know, we've talked a lot about games and, you know, when you look at OMG Pop and you look at Zynga and, and, and uh, NG Mocha, there's, you, it's easy to feel like it's kind of a gold rush. And, and uh, you know, and, and when you think about the actual gold rush up in the Sierras, a lot of miners went up there and were looking for a big pot of gold. And, you know, some of the ones who found a great load, like, got really, really rich. And, and most of them didn't at all. But uh, uh, it sometimes feels like a lot of those game studios kind of searching for that hit. I mean, if OMG Pop hadn't found Draw Something at the end of their, their cycle, they wouldn't be the story we've talked about many times up here tonight. Um, but when I really think about the gold rush, like the guys who I'm most impressed by are like Levi Strauss, who figured out how to make blue jeans and sell to every miner, whether or not they had a huge hit. Um, and sell and guys like, well, you know, the, the Wells Fargo company that figured out how to like bank everybody's gold and make a lot of money just banking and protecting everybody's gold. And so, you know, I'm curious of like, outside of just trying to make hit games, and you know, we have Raj with uh, an analyst company, um, what are some of the other big opportunities you see that leverage into the whole gold rush of gaming, but aren't trying to be a studio and producing the next great content? Um, so, anyone want to take that? That's all. So yeah, I think uh, there are two areas which come to mind. The first one is specifically on mobile, the whole area of uh, app discovery and app distribution. So, you know, I think we hinted on it earlier, but the whole app discovery model on through app stores is kind of broken. On Apple, you have to just spend, you know, spend money to get high up on app store rankings to get more organic downloads. On Google, there is, you know, there is no clarity as to what you need to do to get more organic downloads. So the whole you know, app discovery portion is kind of broken on mobile. So, you know, there are any entrepreneurs out there, that's a great opportunity. There are some people who have taken, you know, stabs at this problem. There is Hayes app, which is uh, approaching the whole problem by, you know, looking at social app discovery. But I think there is something there uh, if you can fix sort of the app discovery problem. The second one is actually analytics. And I, I want to separate out analytics into two parts. One is what, uh, you know, what Raj and Claritics are doing, where providing analytics services to gaming companies and also to a whole host of other companies. You soon have a lot of content being published on mobile devices, whether it's through App Store or through mobile web. So analytics for companies to look at. The second piece is thinking about how can you actually mine App Stores to give uh, valuable insights for advertisers. So right now, Apple, doesn't give you a whole lot of information on which app has what kind of demographics of users. But if there is, so there is something there again, you know, and you know, there, are, there are a couple of companies getting into the space like AppNE and this, you know, where can you build something or do something where you can look at, you can give advertisers a channel to get into the whole app store advertising and marketing. So I think you know, analytics and sort of app discovery as the two which I would say outside of just gaming, uh, you know, I would be excited about. Anyone else? Um, so at, at uh, Route One, just because we're very small, we've had to use as much third-party stuff as possible. And I, I've been amazed at 
how much stuff is out there that's really useful. We're, we're using um, PhoneGap, which is basically something that lets you write your application once in HTML script and HTML5 and JavaScript. And then you can put it as a native application on Android, iOS, you know, any other kind of device. For user feedback, we're using a service called User Voice. For um, analytics, we, we're using one called Playtomic, now we're using Google Analytics. Um, and I know I'm forgetting some. They, like, basically, you just do a Google search, you have some problem you don't want to solve, you, you go on Google, and very likely there's something there that already is taken care of. Another one, um, Urban Airship, uh, makes it easier to do push notifications for iOS devices. All of these services are free, and they all seem to run on a model of um, you get some base level of service for free, and then once you cross a certain threshold, you get you pay, which every indie developer is like, can, you know, sure, I'm sure we're going to get to X million downloads. By the time we get there, I'm happy to pay. You know, so you, and, and it's worked for us. I, mean, we, I think we started paying for us, um, user voice because we love it. You know, it's been very useful, and we wanted some some richer features, and so you know, what you go ahead and pay for it. Um, so anything that kind of supports that ecosystem is big. Um, So uh, it's uh, just hitting past uh, 8 o'clock, so I'd love to just kind of ask the last question. So we've talked a lot about gaming and all this stuff. Um, if you could do one company or join one company outside gaming, uh, what other things are, are interesting you right now? I'm going to start here and go all the way down. I think right now I'm just super passionate about what I'm doing, so it's kind of a hard question, but um, I think if I have to look at where the opportunities might be, I'll stay on mobile and maybe poke a little bit into mobile commerce and mobile commerce with a social angle to it. That's what I would look at. Um, though I'm in the gaming industry, we're not building games, so uh, my uh, I think if, you were, if I were to do something, I think uh, Doug mentioned this, game, games today exist on social mobile platforms and still have that uh, conventional notion of you go and interact with Tetris or farm I think gamification has this uh, potential outside of the core gaming concept, whether it's applied to healthcare, to education. Uh, I think I would love to start an app company that applies gamification to a different vertical. Um, <clears throat> I would, in uh, you know, five to ten years, I'd like to be able to print my own phone because I don't like any phone that I've ever had. Uh, somebody pointed out on, uh, on uh, probably TechCrunch uh, not too long ago. I'm not even sure why we call it a phone because it kind of doesn't work as a phone and uh, we use it for everything else. Um, but I, I think the combination of, of sort of restrictions, in both in the form factor, in uh, the things I want to use it for uh, compared to what it allows me to do, uh, restrictions in the OS, you know, idiosyncratic problems that I find with it, uh, and commercial perspective, all these restrictions on, you know, what I can do to interoperate or not interoperate with the, with the operating system. Uh, I look forward to a day when, and, you know, and, uh, if I could start a business, it would be the business that would allow me within a few years to just, you know, spec my own phone out, print it overnight, or, you know, when, when, when the supply chain gets cheap enough, I, I'll do it in my house, but for now, I'm happy to, to design it today and get it tomorrow uh, by overnight mail, um, including that is one of you know, a range of open source possibilities that lets me uh, have the experience I want on the commercial terms I want and just use the internet because I, th I think we've proven that it works. So. Um, <clears throat> for myself, I'm uh, still very passionate about education and games, and so I, I think, uh, you know, I'm, I've been thinking about uh, developing uh, software to, or apps to help uh, educate students, especially um, with STEM, so, you know, uh, the sciences and technology, engineering, mathematics. Um, as you can probably tell, public education system is kind of broken and they're, you know, they're not really expressing these kind of, you know, science, the, the sciences and math and, you know, people are just really afraid of those topics and so finding ways to gamify those subject matters and, and, and make it more palatable to, to you, know, you know, students of today, uh, I think is, is definitely an opportunity Um, I think I got into games because I, I really like board games, board and card games growing up. And I, I love how it kind of creates a little environment for people to get together, kind of get out of themselves and do something ridiculous, you know, destroy someone's hotel or slay a dragon or whatever. And um, 
that's what I love about games. That's what I'd love to be able to create is, is um, games that kind of simulate that experience of getting together with a small group of your friends and just doing something fun. Um, board games, you know, they already exist and are out there, but I think with, with the technology we have nowadays, there's an opportunity to create some new thing. Like, uh, think about all the things that make playing a board game hard. You have to find all the little pieces and keep track of them, and you have to get six people to sit down and be still for an hour in one place. And with an iPad or iPhone, a lot of that goes away. So is there some new product we haven't even seen yet that has very much the board game flavor, but, you know, kind of breaks a lot of those boundaries? Awesome. So join me in a round of applause. Thank you. Open up for a few questions from the audience. People want to ask of uh, anyone up here? Um, I guess this might be a question for Buspo. Um, so, what do you see the new target development cycle looking like? Everyone's saying that that's the big change, everything's getting faster. So, what's the new target? Cool. So I'll just repeat the question. Um, don't ask. Kind of, what's the? We're all saying that like hopefully it moves faster than what old gaming used to look like. So what's the new target development cycle uh, actually happening these days? I think you know you can talk about both Facebook and uh, mobile platforms. So you know, the challenge on Facebook right now is again. So it comes down to what kind of game you're trying to make. So if you're trying to make a virtual world game like Cityville, Farmville, uh, you really have to think about getting your game to the level of like a castle or the best of breed if you want to win in that space. So your development cycle is going to be long. So you're thinking more in years, not multiple years, but more like a year, year and a half. Again, on Facebook, if you're going after a genre or style of games like Draw Something, uh, bubble games, which are very popular right now, your development cycle could be much, much shorter. So that's Facebook. The development cycle has gone up over the last two years, and I think it will continue to go up, uh, just because game engines are going to improve, and you, you just have to get your best of breed out there. On mobile, the development cycle is also going up. I would say it's probably one-fourth to half of what it is on Facebook. It again comes down to the genre you're going after, is it a virtual world game? Have you done that game? Have you done, do you already have a game engine in place which you can quickly reskin? Uh, or do you have to do something from scratch? Is it an arcade game, casual board game? So it varies a lot, but it's probably anywhere from you know a quarter to half of uh, what it is on Facebook. Cool. Uh, you, over there. I would thank you. This has been really helpful. Um, I think Rod and Doug kind of touched upon this uh, on, on the whole gamification aspect of it. Uh, with Chatter, this, in Enterprise, Chatter is bringing this social aspect to how we connect in enterprise space and with most of us spending half our lives at work. How do you see, Do you have you come across any sort of gamification of in the enterprise sector? Um, and what are some ideas that you could throw out there? Um, we work with an uh, incredibly amazing company called Badgeville, which is applying the concept of uh, gamification. We provide analytics for Badgeville. Badgeville ap applies the concept of gamification for either employee loyalty or customer loyalty on your publisher side. So they work with Samsung, Dell, um, a number of large B2B publishers to build that loyalty, and they use the concept of gamification. So that's a great example, and they're doing really well. I started uh, gaming, I think, 20 years back, playing Pac-Man at work. Uh, but recently, my kid introduced me to a new game, Team Fortress 2 on Steam. And I've been hooked. I've been playing maybe uh, 20 hours in two weeks. <laughs> so re re recently, I uninstalled it because of that specific reason. Uh, there are two questions I have. One, with this, uh, Team Fortress 2 is free. Um, big thing that is being sold is uh, this, uh, this selling hats <coughs> in the game. So I, I never bought a hat. And the reason I got on is the new term, F2P. I'm a free-to-play guy. The only reason is why I got onto the game. So one is, how is Team Fortress 2 going to kind of make money? Second question is, this is on an interesting platform from Wall, Steam from Wall, I believe. I didn't hear anybody here talk about Wall. And I recently read an article about 
the Apple CEO going to walk? Are there mergers coming in this industry? So who uses Team Fortress 2 that can sort of talk about that in free to play? So my take on it, and people could correct me if I'm wrong, is that Team Fortress 2 has been around for a while, like for, for several years, in the space of games, if something's around you know, two or three years, that's super old. Um, so Team Fortress 2 is, is not that new. And there was a time when it was being sold. Now it's because they have the property and people like it, and they have this um, platform of, of Steam, which makes things you know available. And so, and people love, people get attachments to old games the way you love an old TV show. You know, someone might say, I love Lucy, and be like, oh, you know, I'm gonna watch that show. And you're not gonna get the same numbers that I Love Lucy did when it was on primetime, but you know, you can throw it out there and people are gonna watch it. I think it's the same thing with Team Fortress. They, they realize people probably aren't gonna pay for it, but people love it enough and we'll go back and play and you can charge for hats. So I don't think they're um, banking on a whole lot of money coming from Team Fortress as much as let's keep people engaged with this game that people already like and you know, maybe draw in a few new customers. Um, and as to their, I, I would say they're very, from what I understand of Valve, pretty far outside the space of the games we've been talking about. The, the, the kind of games Valve produces are equivalent in budget and size and scope to like a Hollywood movie. You're talking tens of millions of dollars, teams of hundreds of people, and those games, you know, do really well. I believe the like number one media, like the most money generated by any media ever is for a game, not a movie. It was, I think it was Battle, one of the battlefields when it came out, got the record, you know, surprisingly, like made more than any movie ever made. So it, it's very much similar to the movie industry. You spend a ton of money, you could make a whole lot of money, or you could lose a whole lot of money. And that's where this whole industry comes in, is that now with, with your Facebook and um, iOS, you can make a game much, much cheaper, and potentially see you know, a lot of rewards, but it's, it's, uh, it's kind of an entirely different business. I don't know if that makes sense or answers the question. Um, Steam is a digital distribution platform for what would otherwise be packaged goods games. So they uh, uh, start that way, and I think now people are doing purpose-built games that are that, you know, highly adapted to Steam. But you can get very large clients down onto your drive uh, in relatively short periods of time because they're trying to streaming it down and giving you a level of sort of the, or the, the, the elements of the game that you need to play just in front of when you need to play them. So that's the, that was the great innovation there. EA's got a platform like that called Origin. They're repurposing the old Origin Studio brand. Supposed to do a similar thing, you know there are there are other competitors to, to that as well. Uh, but uh, boy, uh, Team Fortress, you, you made me uh, remember lots of development deadlines that were missed because our teams were running at Team Fortress. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then and then I think you asked a little bit about you know is Apple going to buy Valve just because the CEO visited? And I think if every time a CEO visits a company, there's a merger or acquisition, we'd have a lot more of those. Um, happening, but uh, but I but, but I do think that you know it's interesting to think about as we're moving from games on our small devices and on our on our tablets to you know this uh, you know much talked about you know rumored about a uh, Apple TV you know I'm sure that that Apple's actively thinking about what are all the kinds of like experiences that differently would need to happen on a much larger screen and we're even getting on kind of the consoles and and phones today so that was that was my instinct on why. All those rumors started. Um, so I think uh, uh, we had one more question up here in front. Yeah, I have two questions actually. Um, two more. Yeah, just sorry. Um, I'm just curious, what are your thoughts on cloud gaming as a business model and for indie developers? Clouds like for um, OnLive or Gakai. And my second question is, um, as a developer, I haven't really put any social elements in my game. So what do you, do you recommend any tools for any social or monetization aspects for to apply to any classic games like, um, let's say, Pac-Man or Donkey Kong or something. So anyone want to take some of the online or those game talking questions? For the, uh, just speaking to my own experience over the past year with um, doing this, you know, doing storylines, um, I found uh, we're, we're using Amazon Web Services for, you know, cloud s storage and this um, Mongo database, MongoDB, for you know, storing, you know, keeping data on there. All of which, again, kind of in this space of things that seem surprisingly easy to set up, like all the stuff you normally have to deal with on your own. At the low end, you can get it for free and it works fine. If you, at the point where you'd have to scale some, like, massively 10 order, you know, many orders of magnitude more, you'd have to worry about it, but that's something you worry about when you get to it. Um, so I, I've been pretty happy with those services. 
And then um, the second question was tools for social proof. Oh, um, I, I personally was fairly intimidated getting into working with Facebook. I, they're kind of notorious for changing their APIs seven times a month and not really telling you about it until things break. But um, at, again, at the, at the lowest levels, if you're not going to try to, um, if you just basically want information about people and their friends and try to work that network, that information is, the API there is pretty solid and easy to use and take advantage of. My frustration with Facebook has been more on the user side that in order to get access to people's data, you, they put up a little widget that you have no control over that basically scares people away. It says, you know, this game is going to try to do blah, blah, blah. And you'd like to modify that by saying, you know, and we won't, or without your permission, but you can't. And a lot of people drop off at that right there. But um, if you, just technically wise, getting access is, I, I found, fairly simple. And, and uh, you know, no major hurdles. Yeah, I think, uh, let me just add to that. So I think, you know, I agree with most of the points you said. I think the key thing you want to figure out is what social do you really want um, in your game? Is it, do you want to do social like you know, gifting or uh, you know, part requests or you know, crew mechanic? Like what's the essence of your social? And after you figure that out, I think working with Facebook API, if it's a PC game, it's a web, a PC based web game, it's not all that difficult. Um, on the permissions thing, at least one thing which we found is the biggest drop-off occurs if you request a user their email address. So there is a difference in the Facebook uh, extender, in the Facebook's permissions box. If you request their email or versus you just request permissions for, you know, can I post your news feed, can I access your friend's information. So that's one thing, again, depending on the game, you can optimize and test and figure out how big is the drop-off and what's the benefit which you see of getting a user's email address and getting the ability to reach him through a different channel later on. Cool. Um, so I just want to, uh, we have one last question. Uh, it's a question for Vatil, uh, Doug, and probably uh, Raj as well. How serious is like recent news of Apple admonishing maybe even banning developers uh, utilizing UDID for metrics and you know, analysis? Uh, and, and are your companies planning to move away from UDID? So uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, I think a couple of weeks back, uh, Apple banned the use of UDID, which was a unique identifier that was used on the, uh, the iOS devices. Um, to answer your question, I'll take two viewpoints. One is, there's always an ID that publishers can use. Uh, and there will always be some emerging standard that will come up that will replace UDID. So there's an open standard called Secure ID, Open ID that's come out. People use fingerprinting on the device. So there's always an alternative to UDID. The, the flip side of it is, I think, the reason Apple banned UDID was some people were abusing the use of that. Uh, and I think there were uh, <coughs> privacy reasons, for various other reasons, UDID w was banned. Uh, if you're a publisher, you're an indie developer, there's always ways you can get or generate a unique ID and use that for your application. It's particularly relevant for ad targeting. It's, it's very important for analytics also, if you have a large network and understanding uh, Getting a unique ID becomes important. Uh, one could make the argument that, that beyond just uh, uh, privacy protection or, or specific instances of abuse, that uh, Apple may be pursuing an interest here to make sure that that uh, although uh, every individual developer can have an ID that works for his user, that the, the sharing of, of uh, IDs that are universal allows interchanges and economic exchanges among developers that may be cutting Apple out of. Out of the pie. There is there is that view too, and there is also rumblings that they might come up with their own standard, uh, like an open standard that they might break out uh, to replace Secure ID or any of these open initiatives that are out there. So I think it's still early days. Uh, it do, it will have implications for everything that's been developed on the iOS platform. And, and I'll give one last plug, sort of backing up a little bit, which is you know having worked on the Facebook platform side, um, it's really hard to build a platform where. Your focus is your own users. So at Facebook, you know, we had to protect the 100% of people that use Facebook. Apple has to, pre you know, make sure that the, you know, 150 million people who own iOS devices are all having good experiences. And you know, when one, you know, developer has, you know, 3% of users, but in order to get there, it spams the other 97% of people, you know, in their Facebook feeds, like please plant seed, you know, here's some seeds for my farm, and everybody gets that. That's actually not a great experience for Facebook. 
on your iPhone if you use five games and all of a sudden your phone starts beeping with ads and other targeted things because somebody figured out how to tie your information together back to your phone number and starts SMSing you, you're going to stop using any apps. And so you, you often do have this problem of like the opportunities for the few um, you know, are in conflict with kind of making sure the whole ecosystem is healthy. And so, you know, right now we're in the UDID thing and Facebook shut down, banning sharing of the Facebook ID at various points in its history and the permissions come and go and get more restrictive and less restrictive. And, and I think the, the most interesting thing here is it's going to be just this complete give and take as the whole ecosystem evolves. And the platform always wants to make better and bigger platforms. So it does always have that goal in mind. but but in doing so, we'll often, you know, have steps along the way that actually blunt some of the innovation. Um, and, and I think you're just going to see that give and take the whole time. And I can tell you, having sat on Facebook policy discussions, it's a completely different frame that you have to have the whole conversation, knowing that even some developers who are doing the right thing will be impacted negatively. So, um, um, you know, this may be a completely naive question, not being from social media. So we talked about Facebook a lot. Whenever we talked about social games, we talked about Facebook, Facebook. What about Twitter? Have there been any games on Twitter? Has anyone looked at that model? Is it possible? Uh, I've seen some interesting game, uh, applying gamification for Twitter, and in fact Google Maps also, that use the concept of gamification and put uh, augmented reality on top of it. Uh, there aren't quite as many as Facebook games. Uh, that, that e ecosystem will evolve. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's right. I think it's an under it's an under leveraged platform for gaming. It's, it's going to be a different kind of gaming, uh, at least in the uh, you know in, in the near term. But yeah, I think I think, I think there's a, a lot that could be done. You know, you're talking about Facebook and the and the you know, it was it 97 and three, but it's 50 yeah. 50 at least to people who uh, you know gamed and were happy to get uh, happy to get messages. And people who absolutely hated it. Twitter, I think it, you know, it might actually be 97. I think that's not a, that's not the people that go to Twitter to game. They have a lot of gaming platform, but I think you know, well defined, uh, well uh, you know, well crafted experiences could, could absolutely work on Twitter. And the basis there is support a you know a, a hefty uh, a free bundle. You know, one last question. It may not look like a game when it comes up on Twitter. For in, for instance, if you look at Pinterest, it is a kind of game think of it, what drives people to pin up images and get people to come. It is a concept of gamification that's been done in a very subtle and interesting way. Yeah, let, let me just add to both those comments. I think, so we looked at Twitter as a platform, um, Stormate and Zynga. There were some games early on on Twitter platform, more like x or you know Mafia style games. What we did find in some of, uh, you know, some of the analysis and early experiments which we did, is the click-through rate which you get from uh, from posting a Twitter tweet uh, versus posting something on Facebook, there is a big difference. And I think part of the reason comes from the fact that on Facebook you have your real friends, so your real social graph. So you know, if I'm requesting fertilizers for my farm, and it's coming from me, you're most likely to click. On Twitter, the challenge is the social graph is not you know, real per se. It's like you, know, you have a bunch of followers and you're following someone, not necessarily if you're their friend. So I think that's the challenge, and the, the second one is just their platform. Um, and, and I just add, I, I worked at Twitter right before I joined Greylock, and I think one of the biggest differences of Twitter versus Facebook is on Twitter, you're there to quickly consume information and sort of get out. And you know, the, the goal of Twitter was really to have you open the app five to ten times a day, quickly scan what's important to you based on who you're following, and, and kind of just be updated on the news. And, and leave and not necessarily spend a lot of time. Whereas at Facebook, a lot of people go to Facebook because they're bored. And the first thing they want to do is hang out with their friends and look at their friends' pictures and their friends' profiles. And they're like, hey, now let's play games too. And that's sort of why games just so naturally became such a, a core behavior within Facebook ecosystems because you were already there to spend time. And so I think one of the big tensions is, is you know, we haven't come up with the games that are the same kind of quick hit and maybe like draw something or something, but like we haven't come up with those games that are like quite the same kind of quick hit back and forth that would really work inside of the, the Twitter time patterns that they would in, in Facebook. Um, so anyway, I think, uh, wait, one last question. Yeah, um, I'm not a Facebook person, but I was wondering if there might be uh, some kind of a, a software that would allow people to do prototypes that
address that because um, my, my students are always constantly looking for a, an easier, faster way to prototype and, and build games. And so uh, a number of different things, so, so depending, on, so if you're not a technical person, um, uh, something like uh, a game maker, or uh, a game salad on a Mac is a, is a drag and drop prototyping tool. Um, they, they try to, they're, they're advertising it as a, you know, development uh, um, uh, kind of uh, you know, software, but um, you know, it's more of a, pro it was designed as a prototyping tool. So it's very easy, drag and drop. Um, all the game logic, it's all um, just, you know, a bunch of dialog boxes, so no, no you know, learning of, of, you know, scripting or programming what, uh, needed. Uh, on the PC side, uh, there's something called a Construct 2, um, and that's, again, it's a very drag and drop. And, and both of those are free to use, uh, at least the, the, the basic versions. And then, um, you know, depending on your, your comfort level in terms of programming, you know, uh, UDK is very popular for artists to create uh, 3D, very engaging 3D worlds. Um, you know, one of the big hits uh, on, on iOS is uh, uh, Infinite Blade uh, and Infinite Blade 2, and, you know, you see some really awesome graphics, you know, triple A title, uh, you know, style graphics on that. Um, and then, of course, U Unity is a big one, uh, very popular with uh, you know, a, a lot of you know, uh, developers. And so, um, there, there's a myriad of, of, of you know, free and almost free you know, uh, uh, tools out there. But um, yeah, Game Salad and uh, uh, even Game Maker on the PC, if, you know, that's, that's also kind of drag and drop. But I think Construct 2 is even easier to use. Awesome. Awesome. So, um, I, if people have a few minutes to stay afterwards and want to ask any one-on-one -on -one questions, I'm sure they do, but uh, please join me in thanking the panel for a really great